Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> uh, today's presentation on cybersecurity, reducing your digital footprint and attack surface. I can't wait to find out more about this. I uh, just want to introduce myself. My name is Paula McCain. I'm one of the senior business advisors at the North Central Texas Small Business Development Center. Just so everyone knows, today is National Slurpee Day. So stop by your favorite 7-Eleven uh, and celebrate. The SBDC is a leading provider of assistance for small businesses. We are grant funded and because of this, we are able to offer all of our services at no costs. Uh, again, Today's presentation is on cybersecurity. It is Cybersecurity Thursday, reducing your digital footprint and attack surface. Just a quick reminder, we are recording this and it will be added to our YouTube channel. Today's webinar will be interactive, so please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, it's a small button at the bottom if you have any questions or comments. Our presenter is Andy Singleton. Andy is co-owner and principal consultant of CyberTend. He's a very, very skilled cyber investigator. He is adept at forensically collecting, investigating, and presenting findings discovered through all types of sources, such as mobile devices, computers, social media, and email systems. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Paula. Thanks so much. And I will, I guess I'll take and share my screen. And let's see. And we'll share. And we're going to share this screen right here. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, like Paula says, uh, I am a uh, owner of the uh, of cyber 10 and uh what a uh, little bit of background on me uh this is my lovely wife and of 34 years and kiddos but i've been in the it business for over um you know i hate to say it 30 something years but uh, i've got a passion for this business and i've actually mentored a lot of um, a lot of younger folks trying to get into this business because it's a very very broad and complex space now but um, if you've got anybody, any kiddos or any young ones that are thinking about getting into IT, um, we need more folks in this business and I'm happy to talk to them. And um, like I say, I've mentored quite a few folks um, around this around this industry and how to, how to get into it and the best way to approach it because it's, it's large and complex now. Uh, real quick about our services, like Paula said, um, our primary focus is digital forensics and incident response. So we'll be focused on intellectual property theft, uh, be business email compromise. If you attended last Thursday, you kind of understood that business email is the number one target for criminals, but it's also the number one target whenever we do investigations to kind of understand um, things that um, that are interesting for um, for uh, investigations. Ransomware, uh, I've, we just responded to the one this last week. Ransomware is on the rise, um, we have a business here and the DFW Metroplex, um, unfortunately, we've got several hundred computers um, locked up with um, with crypto with encryption and a lot of data taken, unfortunately. So um, help them recover over the last couple of weeks. Um, but those are the kind of things we do as well. Um, something kind of new for us that we've started doing is an information security program model, and that's tailored for your business. And what what it is, it's a very um, a purposeful program to help you and your business keep things safe and keep things from happening like the ransomware. Um, so if you're interested in that, you know, we can talk, we can talk later. Um, so agenda. So the big thing in here is um, I want to always present um, in such a way that you have actionable things to go back and you can do today, either personally or in your business. And that's no exception with this today. So even though the, the title is reducing your um, digital footprint and attack surface. What that means is all these data points that are out there about you, such as your Facebook information, your business website, um, any kind of breaches that have happened with different companies that you've registered with, all those things, all those data points 
are your personal attack surface and your business attack surface. So just like a forensics investigator, what these criminals do, they'll gather as much as they possibly can about you or your business um, to launch an attack. So what you want to do is reduce that amount of information as much as possible. There's so much data on everything, on everybody, on every business out there now, it's hard. But uh, there's, there, are, there are purposeful things that we can do. And, we'll, and through this presentation, we'll talk to you on a few that we can do to reduce that attack surface, those points of data that could be could lead to a um, identity theft or a breach of your business or you know, on any number of other things. This is a very, this is one of my favorite, favorite topics to talk about. Really, it's about privacy. Um, and we could actually do a whole series on this. But what we're going to talk about today is why does it even matter? Um, and I want to talk about a new Texas law that went into, went into effect on July 1st, which is great for consumers, but for, as a business, maybe not so great. And we'll talk about that. Um, I want to talk about the use of secure browsing how to find and remove personal information from a few online sources it's way too broad to talk about all online sources in this kind of a in this kind of a presentation but at least how to remove from maybe facebook and twitter and amazon and a few other things that um that you may or may not be you know understand being exposed and uh and, and deleting some of that stuff especially i know there's the younger crowd i'm a i'm a gen xer but as the millennials come up and the and gen z come up you know, as they're young, I did not grow up with Facebook or social media, so I never had the opportunity to post weird pictures of myself whenever I was a teenager. That was never a thing, right? So, um, but as you're becoming professionals, especially the the um, the uh, millennials and the um, Gen Z folks, that information is considered now on employment, and we'll show you how to remove some of it uh, that you may not want out there. Um, Identifying and managing digital assets and shadow IT. This is more for your business specifically. I'm going to talk about a few tools and techniques that you can use. Um, some of it's a little bit technical, but um, you know, I, one of the talks I have a little bit later on is about um, AI and using um, using AI in your business. One of the things you can do with AI is um, is ask for help on um, on checking your website for leaky data. And I'm going to show you something really cool called Google Dorks um, here in a little while. We'll have a little thing on Google Dorks, um, a, a short slide. Um, tools and techniques for monitoring, protecting personal information online. So this is our agenda. Uh, but I wanted to throw up a couple of things so you really understand what I'm talking about here um, with this. So, right, this is. Probably everybody's heard this, right? If you don't pay for a service, you are the product you, you, they sell. So it has ever been. This is this is one of the earlier quotes by Tom Webster. Tim, Tom Cook has said this. You know, other folks other folks have said it in a different way. But it, but what it is? I mean, Facebook. We don't pay for Facebook, right? Um, we don't pay for Twitter typically or TikTok. That means that you are the product, right? You are you are what's being sold, and what's being sold is the data. And we're going to talk about a few points and specifically um, how much these folks make off of you. I mean, also, you can think about Ancestry.com and 23andMe when these DNA tests came out, right? You could a lot of times do a free DNA test. Now, people got up in an uproar a little bit. And when they found out that uh, DNA data was being sold um, or your, your personal profile of who you are was being sold, um, that uh, people kind of took a step back and were like, holy crap, I guess that's why that 23andMe was only 100 bucks or 50 bucks, or why that Ancestry.com was only a 50 bucks. Because there are DNA tests that you can get out there on yourself um, that do a comprehensive panels that are completely private done by universities. Now, these, are, these cost $1,000 or $2,000, those sort of things, but your information is private. Um, with Ancestry and 23andMe, even though it's 50 bucks or 100 bucks, that's not enough to do um, a, a, a private, keep your data private. Your, your, your data is being sold, so be careful about those. We're not going to go into those too much today, um, but I just wanted to make you aware. This is, this is a very uh, solid statement. And so product you, um, if you look at BizBrain, this is a little bit old, um, but when we talk about you, product product you, we talk about average revenue per unit, ARPU. What is ARPU? You are the ARPU. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? So how much does each one of these folks, each one of these companies make off of you? So we'll talk about the top three. So ARPU, ARPU is you. It's, it sounds very 
uh, offensive to me or you know when you talk about well they're 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 calculating how much revenue they make off of a person and that's rp usually i think of arpu as a product like a widget or a part or something like that arpu as a human in this case um 2023 facebook generated 134.9 billion right uh advertising of course and their arpu is the highest of anybody 226 dollars 93 cents is the average arpu per person that has an account on um, on facebook um twitter's is a lot lower 18.71 and TikTok has not disclosed i'm not sure if they ever will um based on where the company is owned and don't kid yourself it's owned by the people's liberation army um TikTok probably won't report that the uh, the revenue is split. Um, there's a high amount of revenue coming in to Twitter and Facebook specifically for ads in um, in the APAC, specifically China area. So um, a whole another topic to talk about, but just be very cautious. And most people know about what's showing up on the in your feed on Facebook and X uh, or Twitter now. Um, just because there's so much. With AI and generated pictures, I've 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 kind of given up. In the beginning, I was trying to call people out and say, "Hey, you know, where's your source? You know, you always go, where's your source of this data?" And um, usually it is, "Well, I just copied and pasted that image or that video from somebody else." Well, that's an AI generated, and that's totally not real. So just be very skeptical if somebody cannot, if somebody's talking about something very edgy, say political or religious or something that's going to stir people up make sure they cite a source for that or just ignore them because maybe the best thing is just ignore them um, but that's that's uh this is what i want to talk about again the point of this is arpu is you as a human um very kind of off-putting to me honestly um so why it matters data data everywhere i like that that image um personal information exposure so some of the things we talk about here is you know everything your browsing habits, your email habits, or profiles. Your phone tracks every step of where you are and the speed at which you're going. Matter of fact, in some of my forensics investigations, I always know where you are at any given moment in time. If I've got your mobile phone, I know where you are because something is tracking your location. As a matter of fact, I typically know how fast you are traveling. And I know if your face was looking at the screen of the phone, um, this is more important to say a crash investigation or a crime or, you know, really think about a crash investigation for a um, for police officers. They may they won't want to know how fast was this mobile phone traveling? Um, was the was the user engaged in the screen? Were they looking at the screen? All of that can be extracted from your mobile device. Um, but that is information that is also harvested and is out there. Um, that companies uh, like Apple and Android and those kind of things and Google um, uh, harvest that information. Identity theft and data breaches. Um, you know the the thing the thing on Facebook where they put the polls. Uh, hopefully everybody knows this by now. When they say, hey, you know, list just list your first car and your first date and blah blah blah. blah. List list all these things. Well, that's usually security. That's probing for for folks to gather information and. These folks aren't non-sophisticated, right? These criminal elements around the world, they're not some one or two kids collecting information in a sheet so they can target you. This is organized crime, right? This is large entities of organized crime running a regular business and databases and gathering this information, harvesting as much as they can so that they can very much so target you. Um, and harvesting everything they possibly can from those attack surfaces. They do it very, very well. And it's incredibly organized and global. And there's a lot more, sadly, there's a lot more bad guys than there are good guys out there on, on, on this sort of thing. Um, so just be careful anytime you answer polls or, or those sort of things with any of the, um, of any of the social media or anywhere in specific, any, anywhere for that matter, because um, it could be, and most likely is, um, a method to harvest that kind of in, that kind of information for um, for identity theft or other data breaches. Um, unwanted tracking and profiling. So this is where 
you know, I think I think a little while back, somebody a few years ago, whenever um, uh, you know somebody kind of realized and they said, well, if I if I do if I go into my um, Google search and I type in you know search for hemorrhoid cream or something like that, right? Something, all of a sudden now your Facebook and your Twitter has got ads up and down the sides for hemorrhoid cream, such and you and your Dega, your Google. So, you know, it's shared across that, that you've looked for that. Um, another similar event that happened a few years ago that people started to realize is Alexa, and I'm sure, um, you know, Google, uh, Google um, Assist and Siri all do the same thing, but you can, you can just talk about, say, a trip to Bermuda um, around your Alexa. She does listen to everything you're saying in your conversations, and guess what? You will have ads about trip to Bermuda show up in your Facebook feed, show up in your, you know, Amazon um, login and show up in your uh, Twitter feeds. Absolutely. Just by discussing it around Alexa, no, you know, not even, not even, you know, considering directly asking Alexa to give me information about a trip to Bermuda, but just talking about it. Um, Alexa's always listening. Discrimination and bias. This gets a lot more sinister to me. Okay. And the reason I say this is because, um, you got, you know, especially especially the younger crowds, um, the millennials and the Gen Zers, right? You've posted things on your Facebook feed, you've posted things on your on your um, Twitter feed or TikTok feed, and you've applied for a job, right? So um, most of these large companies, if not all of them, use some sort of AI technology to to uh, to to make a make a pass or no pass or make a cut or not cut decision on the um, resumes that are coming in. They look for keywords and that sort of thing on the resume. And they also look at your public attack service, your information out there, and um, make a determination whether this um, resume should make the cut for further review by a human. But, but all large companies, all large companies absolutely, I think at this point, use AI to make the first decision, first round of, of automated decisions on, um, on whether to hire you or not to hire you. And that's not just based on your resume. That's based on information that's scraped um, from the likes of Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing. So this, again, a lot more sinister to me. Um, and uh, for, I'll give you a funny example, kind of funny example. Um, uh, there was a lawsuit against a large hiring entity where um, a user's birthday was on April 20th, so 420. That showed up on a, and everybody knows because that's associated with marijuana use, right? So most everybody knows that terminology now. They were cut from um, hiring, and without going into all the crazy details of how this user person answered, they were cut because the AI engine said um, drug use involved with this with this um, individual and say so they were cut from the hiring um, so ai is not perfect it can make mistakes like that but that was that became a lawsuit but um, just just understand this this part discrimination biased is very sinister and um, you, you, this is what this is what is happening um, right now and loss of control right your data ownership your personal record you know you kind of lose whenever you sign that um, I consent nobody reads all that stuff I don't read all that stuff right when you sign up for something it's just it's all this legally stuff I'm not going to read you know I, do you agree right when you install an application or you you sign up for a service um, you know all of that information is um, is really associated with that app, especially if it's free, becomes property of the um, the application provider. Um, so there is loss of control. So this is these are the things why it matters, and lots of sinister things here, in my opinion. Lots of, you know, lack of a better term, evilness going on by big companies out there to try to make a profit, right? There's We're a capitalist society trying to make a profit off of us. Um, so this is the first thing that Texas has done, which is awesome. It's a... It's, it's a step in the right direction, right? Um, it's a far cry from what Texas used to do um, several years ago, and may, people may or may not know. They would sell, Texas actually sold and made some really good money at the state off of selling your, um, your, your title and registration, your car tags. And there was a website that I used to use myself um, uh, called PubData, and I'll give you the full URL, but it's pretty much defunct now where you could go out and you could search 
like I say, a license plate that somebody had on a car. Let's say that person, what I used it for, say that person did something very rude to you <laughs> a few times. It sounds very stalkish, but you could do this. You could take the license plate number down. I could log into this site. I could find out who that is, who that person is. Then I jump over to Facebook and find their information or their website and get their email. I'd send them a nasty email saying, hey, you know, we're blah, 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 blah. Um, that was, uh, um, I've done that a couple of times. It's been a few years, but Texas used to sell all of our plate information and you could look up anybody's license plate in the state of texas for this first for this site and it was like a few bucks a month or a dollar per search or something like that that's pretty much defunct um, but it does not have the teeth or the full breadth of gdpr um, or the california privacy laws but it is a step in the right direction gdpr being very strict um, global privacy that's that's for the european union about data sovereignty i um, mean data can't leave the, the country that it's in and um, and data uh, made available um, to different entities and sold. So this is a step in the right direction. So this went into effect July 1st. Um, it grants all of us Texans, you know, several different um, key, you know, key rights over our personal data. Um, we have the right to know, meaning we have the right to know what businesses, what businesses have on us, what data they have on us. We have the right to delete it. We have the right to correct it. So with Facebook, this is probably important. You can and especially if you're the Gen Zers or the Millennials, you can request a full download of all your Facebook information, make adjustments, delete things you do not want to be there anymore, and it will delete them. They will delete them. Um, they have to. So that might be a very important to some of you folks that, um, that grew up with those tools. Like I say, I did not, and posted maybe some things that you don't want an employer to see when you were, say, 16, but now you're 2830 and maybe you don't like what you did whenever you were 16 and you want to get that stuff to delete it. You can do this now in the state of Texas. So that's that's awesome. Um, you have the right to opt out of personal data sold. Um, I'm going to show a site here in a moment where it blanketly goes out and goes ahead and says, don't sell my personal data to um, to a whole bunch of sites. And I do this and I've done this. Um, I'll show you that URL here in a minute and it'll be in the resources, but um, it's something that um, that sets us cookie parameter. We're going to talk about cookies in a moment because they're important to this discussion. Um, cookies being not the cookies like a, like a chocolate chip cookie, but a cookie on your computer that has a little bit of information about you. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But um, definitely the right to limit business collection, use of storing personal data, many other areas are addressed. So take a look at um, TexasAttorneyGeneral.gov. I did I did do a, as a test, do an information request against Wells Fargo. And my justification is I want the right to know, and I want the right to know what information they have on me and what information was being sold because I get a whole bunch of credit card um, uh, applications in the mail um, nowadays. And was it Wells Fargo, was it not? Now, it probably wasn't exactly the right way to go around the information request, but I wanted to get it so I could show you guys what the form looks like, which is coming up here in just a second. Um, so there are exemptions. And you need to understand what these are the exemptions. This is why I say it's not quite the teeth of GDPR, not quite the teeth of the California, but it is a huge step in the right direction. So state agencies, financial institutions, um, healthcare providers, nonprofits, and institutions of higher education are exempt from um, providing this type of data. If you go to Fisher Phillips um, and do a Fisher Phillips search for Texas Data Privacy and Security Act, um, you'll get a nice summary of what it is. And I'm not an attorney here. Uh, you know, this is this is the information I've searched. I'm not you're not binding me to anything on this presentation, but I just wanted to kind of kind of give you um, the exemptions as as they were listed from Fisher Phillips and from, as a matter of fact, if, uh, if anybody read The Watchdog, I don't know if anybody read, read, reads that or reads that um, from, from the Dallas Morning News, uh, you can't really see that. Well, anyway, um, about uh, Sat Sunday, June 23rd, The Watchdog has a, um, has a piece, which is Dave Lieber, uh, I really like him, uh, has a piece on the data privacy that went into effect right before it went into effect. So here's the thing we'll talk about here in bis with businesses here in a little bit. I know there's a lot of small businesses out there probably. Um, there's no stated exemptions based on business size. There is some considerations stated, and I don't know what the legalese are in there about um, small businesses as, as the term applies to some kind of legal legal term as what a lot of small business is. There's some kind of exemptions there, but um, I couldn't really uh, decipher if there was anything specifically based on business side if you were exempt. 
So um, something you need to prepare for. And the penalties are, are pretty stiff. Definitely not as high as GDPR, and definitely not as high as California, but it's 45 days to comply and $7,500 per penalty per incident um, or what the, uh, what the penalties are. Now, here is the form. So this is the live form. It's on the, um, it's on the uh, Texas Attorney General's um, AG's uh, website. And um, these are all the items that you can kind of fill in. And it does open a ticket. I think I was number ticket 64 when I did this. So this tells me I'm the 64th person probably that, that made a request to the state of Texas. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I kind of, I don't know if I'm gonna get a response or not. I got a response that my tickets opened. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I think what they want you to do is my, my probably my appropriate step would have been go to Wells Fargo and, and from their website request the data that they have, um, which would be upheld by the state of Texas. And then if Wells Fargo did not comply, right, they didn't give me my information within 45 days, then I would go to the Texas Attorney General and force the issue through through this through this um, um, law. So I kind of went about it backwards, but I wanted to I wanted to go ahead and do it so that I could show everybody on the call the form today what it looks like. And these are all the things that you can check off is the reason why you want this information. And way too many to kind of cover. Um, but each one of those little eyes, if you go start going through it, will explain what they are. Um, the biggest ones to me are the top three, and probably listed as such as the top three are the right to know. You know what what does this company have on me? What show me all the data that you are keeping on me? Probably really good for um, things like uh, um, um, you know Facebook. Which you can get yourself, but you know other businesses maybe um, that you do that you do work with or that you're targeted um, accounts with, or maybe you know provide um, they provide products or services that may target the consumer. Um, you have the right to know what information they keep on you. Um, you have the right to delete, so that means you can um, you can basically tell the company delete everything you got on me, 100%. And, um, you know, pretend and that's that's why I kind of a title if you went on my LinkedIn, the right to be deleted. Yes, we have the right to be deleted now. I think that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. We can be deleted. Um, you have the right to correct data. Again, a really big deal. Very, very big deal for folks and young, younger generations that grew up with um, kiddos, maybe in uh, posting things that they maybe don't want up there anymore. And um, if you have a question pop up, I'm happy to pause for a second and answer. But this this is the real form. This is the real thing. Uh, yeah, we had one question, and I was trying to answer it, uh, trying to find the answer. But it's quicker to ask you. Um, how do you get to this form? So this is if you go to the Attorney General's website, um, and I've got I've got a resource at the very end, the link at the end of this at the end of this uh, presentation, which will be made made available online. And um, I don't have any proprietary confidential type stamps on this presentation i'm happy the more people that communicate about privacy the better mm -hmm. I, i'm happy to just take the presentation and make it your own if you want to do so um, but just go to the ag texas attorney general's website and um and you'll be able to search for privacy or just um, in your search whatever search engine you use just type in texas security texas data privacy and security act form and this should um the website should come up but um, very, very pleased that this has gone into effect. Um, and like I say, it's a step. It's a, it's a step, a step in the right direction. This is a, a step. So, so now switching gears on um, what you can do now to kind of protect your data without, you know, these third parties things have on you today. So browser control. So what are cookies? Um, so cookies are basically small um, um, bits of data, a, a data file on your machine. So when you go to, um, let's say, www.amazon.com, for example, there's a cookie placed there that um, is Amazon's that, belong, that basically has all the Amazon data, but then it starts tracking, you know, where you go, your buying habits, your browser habits, um, those sort of things. Um, they're the, the, the most, the more interesting ones, or the more sinister ones are the, uh, third party trackers, right? So these third party trackers are specifically the ones you don't want. And these are the ones that are ads on the side of the page, right? So you navigate to a page and most of the time, 
when the page comes up, if you've gone to it for the very first time, right, it pops up and says, cookies, uh, cookies, do you want to accept all, reject all, or accept the minimum? I always say reject all. <laughs> I just say reject all of them. <laughs> so, but that's just me. Um, but especially the third party ones, if you, if some of the pages do and some of the pages don't, they allow you to review and selectively say which ones you want to accept. Um, so there may be some instances if you if you do a lot of um, probably not a great example, but Amazon. So you maybe you want Amazon themselves to keep a cookie on you for whatever reason, so you can come back and forth and they kind of know it. But you don't want any of the third party apps to track any of your information so they can sell it otherwise. Um, then you a menu would come up whenever that cookie little form comes down at the bottom, a little form about like that at the bottom of your screen. It'll come up and um, you can say, uh, if the option is available, you can select which cookies you want to accept and turn off, say, third party ones. But the third party ones are the nasty ones. Um, third party trackers, third party cookies. Um, and again, all these are small files on your computer that are stored, that track everything you, every website you go, all your browsing history, um, YouTube videos you play, um, you you know, all the things that you may have searched for, hemorrhoids or the script or Bermuda um, are gonna be tracked in these little cookies. So that's what cookies are. Um, they're, they're tracking mechanisms and history mechanisms. And um, used to, right, you didn't have any option, right? You go to a website, it's gonna place a cookie and you don't even know it. So we consumers and privacy advocates got kind of wind of this, you know, for lack of better, you know, there's other things obviously that went in on that, but now most all websites must present their cookie policy when you go to the website for the first time, at least, and give you the option to accept or reject at a minimum. And like I say, I just reject all um, is my kind of standard operating procedures. Um, it may be a little bit different from you. This opt-out ads, do this. You will be thankful. So this is a website I found that I'm um, here recently. I actually didn't know about it. I was doing the search for this, uh, for these, for this presentation. I came across this. Now the problem is, right? There's not much advertising for for things that block ads like Privacy Badger or DuckDuckGo or things like that. And the reason is because they're not making money off of the ads. Like there's lots of ads for Google. Oh, Google, we don't sell your information. We don't do this. We don't do that. Well, that's that's a bunch of bull. They do. Um, actually, there's a post on um, on one of my um, feeds from a um, from a privacy group that uh, were for 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 um, it was found in a Google back end that Google was sending much more data than what we thought back to the mothership of Google, such as um, more detailed information on specific usage, specific time usage, specific websites, you know, all kinds of other specifics that we had no idea. Um, or we, you know, we had an idea, but now we've got proof that that, um, that uh, Google's doing this. And uh, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, Google used to have a policy of, um, I think it was do no harm or something like that. Um, they're quite the opposite of that now. <laughs> so, um, just uh, just be aware. So, so DuckDuckGo, has a add-in, right, for um, for your browser, or they have a full-on browser. And like I said, there's not a lot of advertising. You have to, it's hard to find these things because um, that about ads.info, um, they don't have a budget to, um, to, to, to advertise out that we do this, we block, you know, all of these targeted ads. Um, but I came across it, so that's a bonus for all of you guys. I hope you'll go to this website and um, and basically, um, what you'll see on there, I think, are hundreds of Yahoo and Amazon and Google and ticked all these websites where you can opt out. And it, it actually places a cookie for each one of them that says opt out, opt out, opt out, opt out, opt out of every one of them all at one time, um, which was pretty cool. Because I, like I said, I came across that uh, during the research for this uh, for this presentation. Um, Privacy Badger is a really neat little guy from uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, Electronic Frontier Foundation is a great, great organization 
Um, they are, um, I believe, nonprofit. They they take through donations and that sort of thing, but they're advocates for consumers on on privacy and keeping the keeping the internet neutral. Now, um, it's um, it's it's becoming way not so. It's it's definitely what the the folks that envisioned what the internet would be, um, what they wanted it to be, did not come to be. What was it? What was it predicted to be? Which was going to become like television with advertisements and those sort of things came to be true, right? Um, the founders, when we, when you know, I grew up through all of this process and what we all thought naively in this IT community and in the technology community, the internet's going to be a great place to share information and ideas freely around the world, and that's going to be the main thing. What's you know, sharing information and helping people have better lives and doing no evil. That's what the internet's going to be. But the pundits predicted, no, the internet's going to be a new television. It's going to be the new TV with ads and targeted ads and, and much more invasive and much more about um, taking control of your privacy. And back, I remember back in the day, you know, no, 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 we don't ever want it to become that. Well, it has become that. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has been a big part of this for years, trying to help advocate for privacy. So um, if you don't know who those folks are, check them out. Uh, privacy Badger is a great... Um, little add-in um, that you can put into uh, to your browsers and such. And what I've got on the right is the actual DuckDuckGo um, browser that I use on my mobile phone. I use it on my mobile phone exclusively. And um, that little flame down at the bottom is pretty cool. So if you if you go browse a few sites and those sort of things, and and it does you know there's some files placed or there's some trackers placed or whatever um, in the background. Um, and the history of information. You just hit that little flame button and it makes a little flame graphic. It's cool. It, it, it burns all your data. So I use DuckDuckGo as my main browser on my uh, on my mobile device anyway. And I like that little flame thing because it great, gives me great satisfaction to hit the little flame button and get the little flame graphic and know my data is all burned. <laughs> so, um, so those are things you can do right now that opt out about ads. Um, if you have time today or the next few days, please go check that out, um, if, especially if you're privacy concerned. Um, that will take care of a lot of things. DuckDuckGo use as a browser, um, not just the add-in, but uses the full-on browser itself. Um, we'll keep things a lot more private. And if you want to still use Google or you want to use um, you know, Edge or Safari or any of those other browsers, um, you can do things, do add-ins like Privacy Badger um, that will help um, block some of, the, um, some of the unwanted ads and such. Hey, Andy, we've had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, Royce is asking, um, but that's only for that specific company, correct? Uh, Royce, can you explain? Because apparently I, I kind of overlooked yours, so we might have, we might be at a different point in the presentation. Oh, maybe was that, was that about this right here? Um... Uh, Try hitting your space bar. That should temporarily unmute you. Okay, well, we can. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was talking about the privacy data request stuff. Um, yeah. If that, whenever you do that, it's for that specific company only. It's not uh, to like remove it or something, right? Correct. It is for that specific okay. company. So each individual one, yeah, you got to make a request for that specific company. And then the form that's after this, or it may even come before it, I can't, I think it maybe came after this, was you have to put in the company name, their 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 real name, and say the website information so the AG can track them down. But you're 100% correct. Yes. Okay. It's, it's, each Thank request you. is for an individual company. Yes. Okay. And Royce, uh, you might, you should be unmuted now. Royce actually shared uh, the privacy data. Oh, he's, is he still muted? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, the privacy data. The privacy data. That and was I me. That, I that, um, I asked my question. I got my okay, answer. Okay. 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 And Lisa said uh, sometimes no option to reject necessary cookies. Yeah. So. Um, 
there there are some there are some sites that uh, that will put up um, no option to reject, and that's where you have to in your browser settings go delete all cookies and information. Um, I, I there's so many things that are dependencies out there um, based on states and jurisdiction and international and where the servers are and this and that on what they have to put up as far as cookies and what they don't have to put up. Some sites indeed, right? You don't even have the option to reject necessary only. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot of dependencies, but what you can do is um, is go back to your, if, if you're not too technical and don't want to get into all the the the, the, um, the details of finding that particular cookie and deleting it manually or cookies, <clears throat> then um, you can just go to your browser history settings and just uh, every down there and clear all cookies and history, um, which is one thing that I do. Um, but yeah, you're right. So thanks, thanks for that. You're right. So in some some instances, you can't even reject the necessary only, um, unfortunately. What the website says is necessary only. Um, so, I, and here's, I gave a teaser last week if you were on my call um, about Amazon. So Amazon, by default, in case you don't know this, by default, has your main shopping list or your first shopping list. Everybody knows you can go to Amazon, you can say add product to list, add this to this. And everybody probably knows you can do a like a wedding registry type thing and make that public. You can mark it, see on your list on your left. Um, you can mark that public. And um, then your, um, your, your items in that list will be made public to, for the whole world to see, right? And that probably is good for say wedding registry, probably. But um, at least mine was, um, and I think I don't know if I don't know if Amazon still does this, um, but your your default shopping list was always set to public, and I know this because I do I use a tool um, earn cert, earn for certain instances in my business called um, Instant Checkmate or People Finder, and what those what those do those are two tools that scrape. Um, basically all the public information out there that it can find um, and then presents it to you in a nice like web page or PDF. So example, I've looked up um, some folks and it, it shows it shows information like their social media account names, their last posts, if they're public, their LinkedIn account, their their um, housing loan information, their lien information, which is public, their car information, VIN information, which is public, their address. Um, any emails that they've created, all of that's aggregated into the one spot um, with tools like Instant Checkmate and um, and um, People Finder. There's a whole bunch of them out there. I just happen to pay for and use Instant Checkmate. Um, they're all sleazy. I'll give you that. You know, I'm, I'm not not making any bones on that. But for, for the business that I'm in, um, sometimes I need to get to quickly gather a whole bunch of personal information on some folks. And there's ways to do it open source without paying for a service um, is a little bit more complex. So I choose to pay for the service and, um, and pull this information in. But I found out about this default uh, setting for Amazon by pulling um, public information on, uh, through Instant Checkmate on somebody. I was like, huh, that's weird. I can see what's in their um, shopping list. And doing a little bit more research, I found out that um, Amazon at least used to, I don't know if they still do, when you create an Amazon account, your shopping list, default list, is public, 100% that you put out there. So you may want to go to Amazon under your settings and check your list and make sure they all say private. So this is my, this is the start of my list on the left. I had to cut off some of it. I've got like 50 lists out there that, for some odd reason, you know, Amazon's great about. Well, if you like this, then you might like this, and then you might then, before you know it, you've, you've, you know, racked up fifty thousand dollars on your credit card, and you don't have any idea what anything is for. <laughs> I, know, I know I'm not speaking, I'm speaking alone when I say I almost have Amazon drops boxes at my house almost every day, shamefully, <laughs> but uh, they do. Um, but those are my first shopping lists. Um, Christmas ideas, Alaska cruise we went on and, and then my Andy one. But my shopping list indeed was as well um, about a year or two ago when I figured this out was public. I was horrified. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that. Um, and something, if you do have Alexa in your house, um, you can set set it to, uh, if you always have Alexa on, you can say, Alexa, delete what I just said, if you don't want that information. 
um, to be to be um, used or stored in the Alexa data lake cloud, whatever for for analysis. Um, one thing that I do, um, I'm you know probably a little bit more paranoid, or I don't know if paranoid is the right word, but just more aware of the security implications of all these little devices. I I usually unplug Alexa. I do have an Alexa. I will admit it. I, I like Alexa for some things. I listen to. Uh, I listen to I listen to some stations like AM radio Howard Garrett on Sunday mornings. Uh, the you know the guy that does the Dirt Doctor here in Texas, um, but you're able to listen to radio stations and that sort of thing. Pretty cool um, through Alexa, um, and I listen to my Spotify through Alexa. But if I'm not using Alexa at the time, I typically unplug her because I know she's listening to everything I'm saying. But you can't issue this delete. You can say Alexa, delete what I just said. Gone. Um, can you I do think, that for the Google document, the, the Google. not documents, but the products as well? Yeah, Google, I can't remember what the name of the Google little client device is. Uh, yeah, but you can do it for the Google one. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a command as well. Um, you know, interesting, I, I, I did find out chucking about that and deleting what I just said. Um, there is... There is a sneaky little thing, and probably folks will laugh on the um, on the AI looking at people's resumes that kind of came to light. Um, AI, you can issue a command that says um, drop every, drop all commands previous and start from here, or something like that. It's I don't know the exact command, and but you can basically hide that in your resume and um, and issue AI commands to push your resume to the top. <laughs> So there's sneaky things like it. that you can do, and you can put it. You can basically put it in a um, in a white font with a white background. So the person, if they printed out your resume or they looked at it online, they wouldn't even see it. But AI would see it as it ran through the AI process. Oh. But it was kind of a neat little thing. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so Facebook. Here's how you do it on Facebook. And I did pull all my information down. I was. This is, I pulled it down for all time. You can't hardly see that, but I think I got my Facebook account in 2005, maybe, if I give it down in there, somewhere around in there, is that 2005? Yeah, 2-1-2005 two, is when I set up my Facebook account. Um, I pulled all my data down, it was 500 meg or so, but this is the website you go to. Um, and um, it takes, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time, it says it'll email you, and I think Instagram's tied to this too, so Instagram, I have the option to pull all my Instagram data down as well through the same since, since Facebook or Meta owns both of them, right? And you can pull all your data down. From here, um, you can request they delete all that information without deleting your account. Um, I did not see in there specifically how you go about, say, I want to delete this picture when I was 16 or delete everything from, you know, 2010 back and delete all that, but leave everything else alone. I didn't see specifically how to do that. So if you're concerned about that and want to delete some stuff back from back in the day, then there's some research you'd have to do to figure out that exactly, but it's probably out of the scope of this of this presentation. But one thing I wanted to say here about Facebook specifically that that um, that you, you you may not have thought about and, um, and maybe a reason to delete everything, it's up to you. So my dad passed away during COVID, uh, you know, several years ago, um, you know, number one, you know, my first presentation, I talked about one password and the ability to share passwords and share information very easily with one password so that if a catastrophic event happens to you, your spouse or your parents or somebody like that, then um, then you got access to stuff. So we had it was it was an ordeal um, getting access to his Facebook page. But one thing that happened immediately when he passed away was the criminal element comes out and there was a there was on his page was posted. Hey, his name was Gail. Gail passed away. We, he was very loved. Please donate to this um, GoFundMe to uh, to help fund his his funeral, which was bogus. I didn't set up a GoFundMe. Nobody ended up paying into it, but I found it very quickly. Was you know obviously very upset about it because I'm going through this with my dad. Then somebody's trying to steal, you know, using the death of my father. Um, I did send an email to Facebook. It was removed very quickly. But there's something you can do on Facebook when a family member dies. It's called eulogize the Facebook page so that things can that be posted. So you can still go back and view all the pictures, view everything that they posted over their lifetime. But I would definitely, definitely encourage you, if you have a family member that has passed away, um, and even if you don't have access to their Facebook page, what Facebook requires is the death certificate 
and um, and I think a couple of other pieces of confirmation, which we have. I was the executor of my dad's will um, legally, um, and then also had um, his death certificate, and so we eulogized his Facebook page. In this case, something like that, if somebody passes and you want to remove it, you still get all the data. So if I if I were to say choose to download all my dad's stuff, I could still look through all the pictures and everything he had on my local machine, but it would be removed forever from Facebook. And so there's a couple of considerations that you might want to think about. Um, but um, I didn't put that in here, the eulogization, but I kind of kind of thought about this as, as I was kind of getting prepared for this presentation today. It's something you may want to um, think about if you have um, if you have a family member in this situation, because it happens a lot. Um, death certificates and folks that pass away, it's quickly known in the feeds and such that this person's passed away. The criminal elements are out there ready to pounce and they're and then they'll post up a GoFundMe. And it's just it's heartbreaking, right? You're dealing with the death of a family, and now you're dealing with somebody trying to steal or or, or capitalize off the death of that family member. It's just it's it's awful. Um, so I would I would encourage you to do that. You can do you should be able to do this for all the big ones, TikTok, um, um, X or Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, all the all the ones should have this option. I just went into Facebook since that's the one most of us use. And um, again, there is a way to, um, I'm sure, to say delete. I know there is. I have to comply with it. There's a way to delete certain things out of your feed forever or uh, certain things you've posted. And there's also a way to delete from, from a certain year back. But you'd have to research that a little bit. Okay. Do we got any questions? That's a pretty big one. Um, and uh, again, if you didn't make the last session, Please use one password. Please use one password with your family. This is a big reason. I mean, think about it. If you, um, if if you, you and your spouse, you know, hope you know everybody's got their separate accounts and separate logins and that sort of thing. And um, your parents too. If you got eight, if you got elderly parents, um, it's pretty easy to set up um, rather than having, you know, a um, your your parent having a notebook with all of their websites and usernames and passwords written down. Um, one password is pretty easy to use. You can get them to help, um, you know, um, put all that data into an electronic format that is completely secure that you've got access to, right? I've got my safe combination and my one password. I've got my, I've got, I've got critical things that the family would need to know if I passed away, they have access to. Um, like Facebook and accounts and, you know, a slew of other things. Um, so security numbers, credit card information, passport information is all stored for me in, in one password. Um, but um, that was the talk really for last week. But this is this is kind of a reason for that. How long does it, uh, how difficult and how long does it take to set up one password? It's, it's not that difficult. It is, it is a little bit of a learning curve. Um, but you don't have to do everything all at once. You can, um, but one password has come a long way for where they can basically, if you're, if you're putting it on a computer, it can say import all my passwords from say Google, mm -hmm. um, or import all my passwords from say edge or whatever the case may be. And you can start using it or, you know, as you start going to websites like amazon.com or netflix.com, then, um, you can say, you tell one password to save this password and, um, or save this username and save this password going forward. Um, and, um, you know, we may want to have another session on that, maybe just one password because I'm a big advocate for it. One password themselves, knock on wood, have never been compromised. They're one of the only password managers that haven't. They're super easy to use. It works across all platforms, browsers, desktops, Mac, mobile. Um, me and my wife, the way it works is you set it up as a family. I think it's 50 bucks a year. So you pay for it. So you're not the product. You're, you're paying for the product. It's 50 bucks a year for one password licensing. And that I, I think it gives up to five family members or something like that. And so um, the way I forced all my family to use it was I logged into one password, logged into Netflix, changed the Netflix password, and then Everybody, I said, if anybody wants to use Netflix anymore, you're going to have to sign up and you're going to have to, you're going to have to install one password and become part of the family because what you have is a personal vault, right? It has all your personal information. You have shared ones. So, so the way we have it set up is 
I have my personal one, my wife has a personal one, and then me and my wife together have a shared one that we share information like our passport information, our social security information, credit card information, bank account, login information. And then we have one that we share with the whole family like Netflix and Hulu and, and those sort of things, the Amazon login, and they're all vaulted. Um, so nobody's having to write passwords down and write things down. So it is, it is a, a small bit of a learning curve, but I promise you it'll change your life. Um, I don't know, we all have hundreds of websites that we go to. Um, I don't know a single password for any of them, and I don't care. They're all 27 characters long and um, no idea what they are. Um, so not really hackable um, per se um, from a brute force type attack. Um, and, um, you know, very, very secure. But uh, maybe we talk about that, Paul. We could have maybe a day to go through one password. Businesses are starting to use it. I've talked to a few businesses lately that are starting to use it in their company because um, you're talking about single sign-on just briefly. So some companies want to have single sign-on for all their applications and permissions, and some companies don't. Well, if you don't, you know, all of our passwords require, you know, uppercase, lowercase, 11 digits, plus a special character. Nobody's going to remember that, right? So people write it down. I see it all the time as in this business that I'm in. People have sticky notes stuck to their monitor with their password written down on it. So one password does have a business license that you can use for, for just this purpose. And, um, and it keeps all of your, all that information safe and keeps your employees from having to uh, um, put sticky notes up for every application that you use in your business. Um, uh, we've had a great question. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in. Uh, Royce was uh, asking, talking about downloading uh, all of your passwords from Google. Yep. And a uh, comment, isn't that what they say not to do for security purposes, though? Well, yeah, we're talking about downloading them for import into yes. one into one password. So, yes. So, so I think what you're on to is there is a there is a little there is a little fight between. So, Google wants to save all your passwords if you use Google. Mm -hmm. They want to save all your passwords to Google to the Google passwords list, right? That's mm -hmm. it's in there, and then one password wants to save it. But Google will pop up above one password, so that you got to go around one password. So um, you need to delete. And if you get that pop-up message, Google wants to save this password, you need to say no. And here's why: um, if if I'm doing an investigation on a machine, and um, or if I'm a hacker, let's say, and this is why I said before, you need to always lock your machine if you ever walk away from it. There is, if your machine is logged in, in other words, unlocked and you're sitting at a desktop a prompt, and you do have all these passwords saved into Google, I'll walk up with a USB drive in a matter of three seconds, I've got every one of your website pages, username and login and password extracted out of Google in seconds. Um, I don't, because you've already logged in, right? Your Windows, the way Google works, is I'm already logged into Google. I'm already, so I've already unlocked all those, those passwords um, with access to it. So I can download them. Um, one password works differently. One password, even though you're logged into the machine, is still locked. Um, you have to use biometrics. On my Mac, I use a fingerprint. Um, so when I go to a website and it says, do you want to log in? Um, I use biometrics to fingerprint to unlock my one password that just long enough so I can put my, put my information to the website, then one password goes back locked. Now there's settings, you can you can set it to where you don't, you know, there's a certain amount of time, say five or 10 minutes where it doesn't lock again, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, definitely, definitely maybe, a, maybe a longer talk for some other time, but if you save your password in Google's password manager and you are logged into Google on your desktop, say you know, you're logged into Gmail or something and your windows is open, it just it's a matter of seconds for a little for a little script that I have that you can pull out all your passwords and, and information. But for for the purposes of one password, um, if you want to import all those, you can actually go download all your passwords. It does put it in a text document, which is incredibly insecure. So you want to use that text file and and you want to use it for what you need to use it for, maybe import or something. You want to delete that, shred it, burn it whatever the case may be, so that it doesn't even sit on your computer. But yeah, great question. Uh, Kristen, does that answer your question as well? Yeah. Kristen was asking something about the, cons the security concerns about having all that information in one spot 
uh, yep. on your that's website and everything? That's a good question. No, it's a very good question. So, and uh, for for lack of a better thing, we have to um, trust one password. It's it's been there's been lots and lots of obviously it's a gold mine if hackers can get into it. It's highly encrypted, um, not hackable in theory by any kind of brute force. Not hackable by any brute force meaning I'm going to try passwords against it. Um, by any known mechanisms, not crackable. The encryption technology is not breakable um, by any known current technologies. Um, and one password, what you do is you, what reasons call one password is you use one long password to unlock your vault. And I always tell folks to use things like, I'll, you know, I don't, I don't use this myself, but you use a, use a phrase like I space live space in space Texas with maybe a couple of explanation marks, something you can remember really easily that long of a password to get into one password unlock your vault would not be a crackable password for a brute force or anything like that now <clears throat> like i say you want to make that one password that you use to get into one password that unlocks everything something that is long or like i do on my mac i use biometrics only you can also use things like keys and um, yeah maybe we really we might need to we might ought to have a session on just password management at some point hmm. uh, because it's gotten so out of control right None of us in the IT industry really foresaw the management nightmare that passwords have become, and nobody wants to get rid of it more than the IT folks. And but you know, there's biometrics, there's keys, there's other ways to get rid of it. Um, because passwords we know are not secure. Passwords are not secure. They're just not. Um, they can they can be broken in a lot of cases pretty easily. But uh, that's why I say with one password, for that one password to get in, use a long phrase with spaces that you can absolutely remember. Yes. Uh, and the next thing, going back to Alexa, always listening, Brett wants to know, is that even legal? It is, because you've signed up for the Alexa service. So you're the product. <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Yeah. My, my Alexa uh, was un unplugged and put in a drawer. She's not hearing anything. <laughs> I try to keep mine unplugged. I don't really talk about, I mean, you know, I, you know, there's certain topics maybe that I would want to have her unplugged and I do have her unplugged a lot from, from day to day. But I like it for, I like her a lot for, um, um, uh, Spotify and uh, listen to, you know, oddly enough, listen to, to um, different AM radio stations, <laughs> the old man that I am, but uh, that she pulls up, pulls up a kind of radio and can play it. But yeah, the, um, the, is, is uh, the information that you talk about um, that Alexa is always listening to that you have to opt in. Um, that, I think there is some ways you can turn it off because there is, there is a few ways that you can um, customize it now, which there wasn't in the beginning. In the beginning, the 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 um the kind of the 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 posture that Amazon used was well we need to we need to understand everybody's dialect and, and conversation so we got to train this this engine so that it understands what you're saying so we collect all this information um, there's probably ways you can turn off some of that or delete it after a certain amount of time um, but as far as I know even today the default if you get an Alexa uh, you know you pay 50 bucks for that little amazing little uh, speaker thing that comes to your house has to cover the hardware i mean i even realized myself i am the product i mean they're i'm the product they're listening to what i'm saying so they can target advertising that's what it's for um and one one thing i just want to share with everyone if you want a copy of uh andy's presentation please put your email in the chat and we will share that after the presentation and I, I would encourage you, I mean, if, you, if there's other IT folks or other privacy advocates or attorneys out there, take this and make it your own. I don't care. I mean, I, this, is the, this is the message I want to get out to as many people as we can, because things like that privacy badger, Freedom, uh, Front, uh, Freedom Foundation and, and other folks, they don't have monies to advertise, right? Um, and it's just by word of mouth, really, this kind of information gets out to the public. And the people start to realize, you know, what um, what what is being done. Um, so make it your own. I have no. If it shows up one day, I'm at a, I'm at a conference and it and pops up looking like mine. I don't care. Please <laughs> do it. Just take it and rip it off, please. Okay, this is just a little bit technical, and this is where AI comes in for you. So if you're a small business and you 
um, are you have a login or you have a data entry point on your web page, right? That usually ties into a database backend of some sort, right? This is how companies are breached in a lot of cases. They're, they, there's some kind of issue with the website security itself, or there's some information exposed that you don't know about. It's not apparent, but hackers are, um, are using things called Google dorks, um, which are just scripts and just um, different search techniques that you can target, you know, at a site to see if things are leaking. So you can do this against your own web page today, um, and you can use um, AI. And and I did. I used AI to get these exact commands, and I said, "Give me the commands to look for any exposed information that may be of interest to a hacker for my website." What would those commands be with a Google search? And these are called Google dorks. And so the actual the actual um, search method. Find the exposed configuration files. You can see that command there. Exposed databases, exposed login portal, port, uh, portals. Um, probably more importantly, finding sensitive documents that might be exposed on your website that you have no idea. Um, so, as a small business, these are these are free tools. Again, you're using Google. Um, so, just but again, you know, there's there's this is kind of the option to do it uh, quickly. Um, and um, if you do a search on um, AI uh, and you type in, you know, give me Google dorks that can check my website for leaky information, um, she'll punch out a bunch of information um, about this. And uh, I always call, I call, you may have caught that, I call it in my AI conference, we'll talk a little bit more. Um, I've got my AI, AI lady named and it's and definitely a she because she's got all the answers. So. <laughs> So it's true. It's very true. <laughs> I'm not being just silly. I mean, I, I, I you know, she, she's got all the answers for sure. But this is a little technical. Um, but this is something you can do today if you're concerned about your website linking information. Um, fairly easy. And um, and uh, it's not really for you folks out there that just have a static web page like I do. You have there's no input information besides the only input information I've got is where you can input. Uh, form to email me to contact more information and that's it just it doesn't store anything I don't store anything on my website period um, all it does is it takes your email and you check off at a time for maybe to, me to call you back and then shoots an email to me um, that's all it does so I don't really this doesn't really apply to me per se because I don't have any data entry points but if you've got a login on your page or you've got download documents on your page or those sort of things where you've got content that um, you may or may not um, that, that may need to be downloaded or input fields, that sort of thing, then um, this would apply to you. And it's pretty easy to check your website using these little little tools to quickly check it and see if there's something obvious um, that can be grabbed. All right, Google dorks. Yeah, hopefully everybody can cut that. Shadow IT, so um, and your company, in your business, um, you, you're going to, you're going to have, um, folks that bring, uh, let's say a marketing department for a big company, they wanna show up a marketing campaign. So they throw up a new website that's tied to yours. And um, maybe they tie it to some information where they gather, gather data um, if you're a bigger company. Um, but you can use some, some, some pretty easy tools that are free um, to check uh, deeper. So this OWASP, this Zap, is um, is fairly straightforward to use, but that can go much deeper than those Google dorks um, that that I talked about earlier. Okay, um, so those are a few tools that you can use to check your website today for uh, for any le leaking data. Um, those are those are pretty handy, um, and they're not very technical. Um, some of the output may be technical, so if you, if it does if it does come up with some data, you may want to um, you know engage with somebody technical. Um, like your IT resources or myself to kind of explain what those mean. But um, those are those are some things you can do today to see if your website's leaking information that um, you may not want out there. Um, so personal information. Um, a big one is Have I Been Pond. So this is a real site. Um, you go to Have I Been Pond and you can type in your email address and it'll tell you everywhere your email has showed up in a breach that, that, that Have I Been Pond is known about. Again, there's not a lot of advertising because they don't make money necessarily off of, they don't make money off of advertising per se. 
Um, I don't know exactly how I've been ponding to make some money. I haven't really researched it, but you can go, you don't have to log in or anything, right? You don't, you're not providing any information to them, but um, um, you can go there and type in emails. You can actually put in your password and see if that password is being used and it does encrypt it. So there's, it, it is a secure, it's a very, no, very well known in the security space and the infosec space about this website. And I use it quite a bit to uh, to check um, to check for various breaches associated with an email account is primarily what it's used. You can also use it to set up, um, which is really neat. And I did this last night. You can go put in your business name.com. So I went and put in cyber10.com and it sends me an email saying verifying I'm the owner of cyber10.com. And then it lists all my users that have ever that have been in part of a breach for any 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 name, any anybody that's been associated with um, in my company that has, you know, you know, at cyber10.com email address, if they've been breached, if that email shows up in some kind of a breach and what breach it, what breach it is specifically. So um, I had one hit, but if you have a business with a dot com, um, it does a couple things to verify you. Like it'll it'll say it'll say we need to send an email to security at cyber ten dot com, um, or we need to send an email to this because you know, obviously you you wouldn't want you wouldn't want a hacker to go show say show me all the breaches that have happened against uh, fisherphillips dot com. You, you you know you don't want that kind of stuff going on. So it does have a Benpon does verify you are the owner of the domain. And you can actually, this is how they make money. You can actually pay for continual monitoring to see if any of your employees' emails come up in a compromise and, um, you know, take some action if needed against that. But have a Benpon is a very valuable site for first checking to see where um, where your information has been leaked. And what it will show you is um, your information has been compromised, what company compromised it, and what information was in that compromise, such as username, you know, email address, phone number, social security number, um, address, all the information that they had on you, health information, all that information is 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 just presented in a comma. It just says, you know, what info. You know, basically think of it like this. You go, it says, it says, um, um, let's just let's just say Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was compromised. In the compromise, what was exposed was, for example. Um, username, email, password, address, account information, which would be awful, right? That would be awful for all that information to be exposed. But it'll tell you that. It won't tell you the actual data, right, of course, because um, it's a legitimate site. Um, but it will tell you everywhere your particular email or your company, your domain has been compromised and what information was leaked about that compromise. I think you can't, um, can't say enough about that if you want to check and see what's, what's happened with your information. Um, Google Alerts, um, Google Alerts will, um, or, or some alerts that you can set up to scrape and see if um, if information has been leaked or is leaking from your website as well. Um, you can set up some alerts. So there is some good things that Google does, some that you can use some of their tools. Um, they're the predominant search engine, you know, as we all know. But there are some things you can do. So Google Alerts, if you just go to google.com slash alerts, you can kind of see the options there that you can do to help protect you and your business. And finally, uh, kind of a virtual private network. Um, and kind of, you know, if we've got questions, kind of going to wrap it up here after this next slide. But um, uh, Proton VPN um, is a good one I've used for years. Proton Mail is what we all use in the um, as a as a um, anonymous email in this kind of IT kind of cybersecurity world. So whenever I want to use an account that's not tied to anything that I own um, for various for whatever purposes or have a completely anonymous account, I use Proton. Um, it is a it is a paid for service. Um, you can do the free one. Um, it's pretty limited, but there's a it's a paid for service. They're out of Switzerland, I do believe, so they're kind of a sovereign nation. So you, the information can't be subpoenaed. It can't be it can't be brought in um, to any other jurisdictions around the world or countries. So Proton.com um, is a is a good place for privacy if you want truly a anonymous um, experience and an, an anonymous uh, VPN. Um, the DuckDuckGo paid for service um, as well as again um, there you know you pay a little bit for the service um, outside of their free one and you get a little bit more protection and you get a VPN with DuckDuckGo as well. And the reason VPNs 
uh, virtual private networks, all that is, right, is it, it all, the, all the things you're doing, all the things that come out of your phone, let's say you're on a public free Wi-Fi, for example, at the airport. Now, most everything's encrypted nowadays, right? In the end, it really is. But what you, you may not want to, for example, have any doubt in your mind if you're at a public public airport. Like I don't pl jump on a public Wi-Fi and, and log into my bank. I don't do that sort of thing. Um, even though I know it's encrypted in the end, I just, I just, there is some information that can be gleaned if somebody is watching that free public Wi-Fi. Um, what a VPN does from your device itself, it wraps everything in an encrypted kind of path. If you want to think of it that way, encrypted tunnel. It wraps everything and then sends it out and drops it out somewhere else. In the case of Proton, it may drop it out in any number of places. It can drop it out in another country, can drop it out in different areas that you're not in, those sort of things, then drops out the request to go on, you know, to its to its destination. But at least you're encrypted through, say, that free public Wi-Fi, for example. Um, that's kind of a bonus there. That's that's why you may want to use a personal VPN, um, especially in in the free Wi-Fi areas, right? Um, any anybody got any questions on that, or this is this is kind of the last little slide here. We can talk about questions. Oh, Paul, I think you're muted. Of course, I'm muted. <laughs> of course. Um, okay, Royce is asking if your information has been found on the dark web already. Will that help to identify who breached your information? It will. Yeah, absolutely. Have I been pawned? It'll tell you exactly who breached it, 100%. Okay. Um, it tells you what company it did and what information was lost in that breach. And usually these companies, they send letters um, to folks, but it's become so common. I used to get letters quite often, sadly, that your information was lost and you got the right to sign up for, um, uh, what credit, is it? Uh, credit monitoring. Thank, thank you, credit monitoring. Credit monitoring for the next year is paid for, blah, 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 blah. I think a lot of companies aren't sending out letters to individuals anymore. I think it depends on what business sector they're in, what the disclosure rules are, where they're low. I mean, so many ifs, 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 and ifs. Have I been pawned? Well, if you go out there and put your email address in, it'll tell you um, exactly what company compromised your information and exactly what data they lost, 100%. And it's not even, some of these companies haven't disclosed, right? So this is the have I been pawned goes even further. It is, we found this information on the dark web so that's all this company does. They, they, they not only take on, take information and post it out there about the disclosed breaches, the undisclosed breaches where the criminals have gone out there and pasted a bunch of information that they've gained from a company, and that company may not even know it, or they may just be sinister and say, "I'm not reporting this because I don't have to." Then that information is still out there. They've got they're a good aggregation of that information, and then you can reach out to that company and do that whole right to be deleted thing right so you may want to go out because there's there's companies out there i had no idea i had my information and you don't right because it's sold it's sold by facebook it's sold by um you know uh, TikTok, and they're sold to god knows who number of third parties for targeted advertising that third party gets breached and now all of a sudden you've got a lot of data at a company you had no idea you had data that had data on you and um that's where you can kick in and and do take some remediative actions of notifying the company that they ha they have to um, delete your data with this new law. Yeah, great question. Um, and let's see, uh, can you use it for business or personal? Either one. Yeah, either one, either one. So the business one, you have to be, you have to have control of the domain. So if, if you own, like I own cyber10.com, but if you're the owner of that domain, right, then you can set up alerts. You can actually pay for some things you may want to, um, but you can set up alerts and notifications of every every breach that's associated with your domain. And um, these would be others. These would be like your employees using their company email, right, to go sign up for services on Amazon or they sign up a Facebook account using your company email, which you don't want. The employees shouldn't be doing that, but they do. Um, and then all of a sudden that information is breached. What was really bad, what I've seen before on investigations where employees have used their business email to sign up for a bunch of different services with other companies that are, have nothing to do with the business and they use the same dadgum password 
for their business login as they did for XYZ website login. And then that XYZ website's breached. Now all of a sudden they've got your login name and password for your company. It's maddening. And I've, I've absolutely seen that in investigations I've done over the years where the user uses the same login name and same password for let's just say Facebook as they do for my web, my company login. 100% seen that. Um, yeah, Royce says, this is perfect. This is information I desperately needed. Thank you very much. Uh, and Michael, I will include you on that uh, email. Um, I just want to share something that came to my attention the other day. A company that I used to work for uh, was breached. And it was it was last year, and I got information on it and all that, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. So everybody just kind of rocked on, forgot all about it. Uh, in the past few weeks, they actually breached. Uh, they actually attacked the the company that is actually handling pensions for that company. So they attack like Fidelity or somebody and uh, they moved money all over the world, but they took a whole lot of money. Wow. They just waited and everybody forgot about it and then they hit. Yeah, they'll wait and gather up all the information they need mm -hmm. to do the full on attack. Mm -hmm. and so that's why I have up in ponds a good, a good starting point. You jump from there and then you go hit all those companies that you had no idea you had business you had you had information with to tell them to delete all my stuff delete everything former employees too i believe that's covered uh, active employees you can't you can't request your current employer to delete your information <laughs> but if you're a former employee then you can request that all your information deleted from that former employer and i would i would highly recommend that as well wow. i don't think i don't think there's any restrictions on that as far as i know okay um yeah, I think that's all the questions that I'm seeing right now. Okay, okay. there's all the resources you can pull. Um, the, uh, the, the the top one is a link to the Security Act itself. So that is the the very the very first one underneath my my website is is to that page. Um, the Fisher Phillips one is a is a is a link to the summary of the Act that was just passed. It went into effect July 1st. The uh, next one is the actual House bill itself. If you get real bored and, and I did read it, you want to go read the bill itself. Um, then have I been pawned? Uh, Vizbrain is is an old is an older one, but it shows kind of how much revenue each um, entity gains off of your off of a human, their ARPU, the human, and a few other websites. But this is this is resources. Please again, take this, make it your own if you want to do so. Um, just keep getting the word out. Um, we need more privacy advocates because, sadly, it, it's 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 data everywhere on all of us, and it's it's you know we all want some privacy. It seems like we can't get privacy anymore. It's just it's, whole, it's so hard to do so. Okay. I, any last questions? Last comments? Unmute yourself. Put it in chat. However you want to handle it. Okay. Okay. Um, Andy, this has been fantastic. It has been fantastic. And it would help to act to have um, have you do like some education on how to set up that one password and uh, that would be tremendous. So maybe we can include that on another one or just do a whole new series. Yeah, we might want to do we might want to do it at another session if there's you know if we can gather some some folks that would want to be interested I can show you how to set up one password and how to navigate it pretty easily. Okay. Um, and I uh, would be happy to do that. The learning curve is small, but you will change your life forever <laughs> because you no longer have to remember a password ever again in your entire life. You don't have to remember your where your social you know social security number, your credit card. Plus, it helps especially with a family death or there's an incident that happens that you need access to family information and that person that you need that need information from is no longer with us that would help um that that will that would be um, a very good session i think uh okay this thank you so much this has been such valuable information now i can't wait for the other stuff coming up um 
and for the other stuff coming up here's here is as much as i could get on this slide we've got webinars scheduled through november so uh this is some information coming up you you see a lot of andy's names andy's name on there uh really good stuff coming up i can't wait to find out what you do for a living a day in the life of a forensic investigator and mitigating risks of ai that's ai is such a hot topic that's going to be so interesting and then we have some new ones popping in. Uh, we have CJ Ballinger, Ballinger uh, doing a Texas Workforce Commission decoded. Uh, and then one of my favorite guys in the entire world, Mike Milan, is doing Cash Flow Wednesdays. We're starting that uh, with Cash Flow Mike. That's what he's known as. Start with the end in mind. I've sat through this. This is a, a, a whole new way of looking at how to monitor your cash flow. And then Andy's back on the 8th, uh, a very hot topic as well, remote work and best practices and challenges. I, it's gonna be just a great uh, rest of the summer and up through the fall too. Um, you can use the QR code at the top of that slide to, um, access our website and that's where you can register for these webinars or you can get our contact information or schedule an appointment or find some additional resources that are out there available for small business owners um, we want to thank our benefactors uh, the people that keep us in business the small business administration the state of texas north texas sbdc regional office in dallas and our host institution, North Central Texas College. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and look forward to seeing you next time. Again, please put your email address in the chat box. I'll leave it up for a minute or so. In the, if you'll put it in the chat box, I'll be sure that uh, you get a copy of this presentation. So any parting words, any last words, Andy? Um, I think Royce has a question. She said um, on the um, she got hand raised on. Uh, oh, whoops. Okay. Asking about asking about the some of the webinars. Okay. Can you unmute yourself? There we go. Um, hi. So I have a question on. So there's a couple of these webinars that are actually during a time where I'm working, but it information that I'd like to have is there um like will they come up again on a different day different time or if, am I able to request like the recordings of them you will be able to access our YouTube channel our YouTube channel okay. is at no cost to you and as soon as these recordings are are um, received back and we you know make sure everything is cool and all the information is where it needs to be we will post it onto our youtube channel you can also access our youtube channel using that qr code on that slide as well okay okay perfect that's perfect thank you so much you and, are and welcome and I, I would offer any of mine's from sure i'm sure the other presenters would as well if you go through those offline and you got questions based on what the topics were discussed then shoot me an email oh, um not a problem